Uh, I work with in the Northeast Fishery Science Center, and my group is really uh, trying to build capacity for ecosystem-based fisheries management uh, and, and, and move the needle towards that. And so a couple years ago, the National Marine Fisheries Service sort of codified what their uh, vi version or vision of ecosystem-based fisheries management was. And really, it's a systematic approach in a geographically specified area and, and this definition recognizes the, the physical, biological, economic, and social interactions that are going on within this uh, geographic area. And then it really boils down to, to trying to optimize the benefits uh, amongst the diverse set of societal goals. So it really boils down to trying to confront trade-offs and trade-offs that are right now sort of implicitly dealt with, but making it more uh, uh, explicitly dealt with. And in that policy, they built a, a series of guiding principles uh, as sort of a roadmap of how best to get at their vision of what EBFM is. Uh, and so, you know, the group I work with is, is tied into some of these at, at all different kinds of levels. But the work I'm going to talk to you today is really about trying to get an understanding uh, of what ecosystem processes are and how they work, and then um, explore and address trade-offs uh, within an ecosystem. Uh, and, and how best to, to fully capture that and express that to managers that are then going to be making decisions within an ecosystem uh, framework. And so uh, I don't know what everyone's backgrounds are here, but I know CAM students and, and, and others are probably familiar, though. One of the best ways to do this is through uh, e the use of ecosystem models. So uh, ecosystem models can help us provide a context and an understanding for what's going on in the system. Uh, they are typically for more bigger picture strategic type of advice, although that they have some limited tactical advice. And I think we are definitely moving towards that direction and trying to build in more tactical advice into these models. Uh, and, and in my opinion, I think they are really a great complement for a lot of the single species uh, work uh, and single species models that, that go on in fisheries now and can really provide that context for what we're doing. And so uh, a lot of the work I'm going to talk to you about today is actually stuff that I just recently completed for my uh, dissertation. Uh, and so the goal of that was to try and improve uh, the ecosystem modeling toolbox. And so uh, there's a, a few different ways to do that. Uh, one is to improve the open source capabilities of mass balance models. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. Um, and then take those mass balance models and extend the functionality so that way they're useful uh, as a, within a, a management strategy evaluation context. Um, and then finally, uh, for my region, try and create a mass balance model of George's Bank uh, that would be useful for managers. And once again, I'll get back to all this as, as we go through. And so really the structure of today's seminar is I'm going to give you guys a little primer uh, of mass balance models and, and how they work in case you're not familiar. And then I'll give you an introduction to that R implementation uh, that Cam just mentioned, uh, which I'm calling RPATH. And then show you how I've modified RPATH to be used as an operating model in that management strategy evaluation context. And then a new mass balance representation of George's Bank. And sort of a, a neat little thing I did for sort of a novel method for tuning that model uh, rather than fitting it strictly to, to data. Um, so as you may or may not be aware, of course, there's many different flavors of ecosystem models. So uh, it's not just one type of model. So you can have extensions of single species assessment models where you're adding some kind of covariate to an existing model, whether that be for recruitment or, or climate or, or something of that nature. Uh, you can have dynamic system models. Uh, so these are your biophysical models, your, your NPZ models, so moving from nutrients to phytoplankton to zooplankton. Sometimes those get linked up to fish, but not always. Uh, you can have what is, are termed minimal realistic models, uh, or sometimes called mice models, models of intermediate complexity. And those are models that are going to uh, tackle a couple different components within the system. You, uh, typically, they have at least some kind of predator-prey interaction going on, uh, maybe some linkages to, to the physical environment. And then finally, you can, you can uh, use what are called whole ecosystem models. And so these are the models that if you're working with CAM, you're probably most familiar with. You know, this is the Atlantis and the Ecopath Ecosims. And so another way of looking at that really is if you take a look at at your trophic uh, triangle and you try and, you know, you want to design uh, the, 
the model and the tool that is, that is best to address your question. So if your question is, is really involved in sort of these upper trophic levels, you know, from, uh, you know, forage fish up through marine mammals or whatever, uh, and it's very narrow, you, you could probably get away with those extended single species models or minimal realistic models. Um, if, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, if you're more interested in, in how the environment's forcing up through the system, maybe you're going with one of those biophysical models. Uh, and then, of course, if you want to, if you want to capture the most uh, realistic dynamics and of everything that's going on in the system, and really try and get at some of these trade-offs, then you go with a whole ecosystem model. And one of those models is is of a flavor called mass balance. And so these models are really good at identifying and quantifying the major energy flows into and out of the ecosystem. Uh, and so that then is helpful at describing how the ecosystem resources how the ecosystem resources work and how they interact with one another. And this allows you to then evaluate uh, the ecosystem effects of, of any kind of fishing scenario or any kind of environmental change that may be happening to the system. And then, of course, you can also then use it to explore some management policy options by seeing, well, if I do this to this part of the system, what, what are the knock-on effects or indirect effects and direct effects uh, in other parts of the system? And so the most popular version of, of mass balance models, of course, is Ecopath or Ecosim. And uh, as Cam alluded to, this, this was started 35 years ago. Uh, it was originally done by uh, Jeff Polovina at the French frigate Shoals out in uh, Hawaii. Uh, and it's since been refined uh, by folks at UBC, uh, most notably Vili Christensen and Dan Pauly and, and Carl Walters. Uh, and they've taken... Um, Ecopath and added a dynamic simulation to it called Ecosim, and then even gone a step further and, and made spatial dynamic simulations called Ecospace. Um, it's, it's a very popular method. Uh, there's over 800 publications. Uh, as you can see from this sort of grab from, uh, from Web of Science there, uh, covers the globe from, from where these, these publications are coming from. Um, it was actually, <coughs> Uh, noted as one of the top 10 scientific breakthroughs by NOAA. So Jeff was working for NOAA when he, when he developed this. Um, and we just had the 35th anniversary international symposium here in, in St. Pete. Uh, but despite all of this publications, it's actually still used very sparingly in management. And so that was one of the things I wanted to sort of tackle with what I did here too, is, is make it more, more useful and more relevant for, for management purposes. And so uh, mass balance, uh, or the ecopath part of ecopath ecosim, is uh, a, a snapshot of the ecosystem state. And so at the heart of that is the trophic model, uh, so uh, a food web where you have all the connections of who's eaten who. Uh, and these models are balanced, but not necessarily in a steady state. I think that's one of the, the common misperceptions about this approach, uh, is that you can have things that are on trajectories and be balanced. Um, and then, so, if you take a really simplified food web here, uh, the way it works is everything is, is eating stuff, right? And so uh, the, the, the model takes account of what's going in, and then so the unassimilated food is the stuff that it, it's chewing and not, going to, not ingesting, or, or it's, for lack of a better term, pooping out. Um, things that are being lost to metabolic processes, so respiration. And then you know, a large chunk of what's eaten goes into production. And then, so it's this production wheel. Uh, so you have to consume enough to, uh, to account for all the production for, for the species. And that, of course, is where you can get this biomass accumulation term. That's where you'd have, um, you can put things on trajectories. The predation mortality and the other mortality, of course, is then where the balance comes in that you gotta make sure that not only are you balancing what it's eating and what it's producing, but that production is then balanced by what it, the predators are eating and how everything interacts with one another. And of course, you also have fisheries removals coming out of that as well. And so from there, we go to Ecosim. And this is going to use that snapshot as sort of the initial state, right? And then it's going to utilize something called foraging arena theory, um, which tracks how these things are going to interact and how things are going to change over time. Uh, and then you can include uh, both biomass and size structure dynamics. So you can have sort of multi-stanza groups within this dynamic. 
And the best way to, to uh, think about this, this is uh, adopted from uh, Walters and Martel's book, uh, and explaining how uh, in sort of ecological theory when they first started, you would think that things worked in sort of mass action principles. So this is where, if you think back to your chemistry days, if you took some chemical A and some chemical B and put it in a solution, they would interact at some kind of, you know, some kind of reaction coefficient. Uh, but that doesn't really account for what we see in nature. What we see in nature is a lot of empty stomachs. Uh, uh, you, you don't see, you see not a lot of um, homogeneity across, uh, across predators and things. You see a lot of specialization that's going on. And so this doesn't really account for that. But then if you think about, well, if these predators, if these prey moved away from their predators and then their, and their prey moved away from, from them, then you would sort of get what these foraging arena places where you would get smaller portions of the environment where you'd have the, the predators and prey overlapping and interacting in sort of that mass action principle. But then you'd also have these sort of um, safety areas. And so you'd have biomass that's available and unavailable to the predator at any given time. And this uh, also explains how you might have um, a specialist where, uh, you know, through evolution, a predator would learn to, to occupy a new or foraging arena theory, uh, foraging arena uh, than the one they're currently using. And so that really uh, explains why we see high biodiversity in the empty stomachs and everything else in nature. Um, and so, uh, so Cam already sort of talked a little bit about this. Uh, so that whole setup is set up in uh, a window-based uh, GUI or graphic user interface called Ecopath Ecosim. And it's really easy to use. And I think that's why there's been a wide prolif proliferation of those uh, publications. Uh, and there have been multiple plugins developed to help people customize it and do the, the, the specific things they want to do. Um, and it is open source, so anyone can take that code and change it and, and, and fit it to what they want to do. Um, but some of the different disadvantages are that it, it's coded in Microsoft.net. So show of hands, how many people know how to program in .net? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then it, it's because it's the way it's programmed and the GUI, it's limited to one operating system. So how many people in here strictly use Windows? Okay, that's more than I thought, but okay. <laughs> Usually it's 50-50 how many people, you know, aren't even using Windows. Uh, and because it's a, a GUI and it's sort of point and click and, and everything else, it can suffer from lack of reproducibility. So you might not have kept track of all the changes that you made for a particular run. Um, and so uh, myself, along with Karim Aiden and, and Sarah Gaitches, uh, from Karim's from the Alaska Center and, and Sarah works for me in the Northeast Center, have developed the uh, R path, which is the R implementation of EWE. And once again, this is really meant to complement and expand the open source uh, possibilities of Ecopath Ecosim. And it uses a, a platform that's widely used by ecologists. So how many people here know how to use R? Yeah, see a lot more people than, than .NET. Uh, and then you can also uh, utilize the built-in statistical and graphical capabilities of R. So one of the things that people do with the, the standalone EWE, the Windows version, is they'll export it and do some kind of manipulation either f to do some stats on it or to plot something up and then have to either import those uh, results back in or, or just switching back and forth between programs. And so all that together sort of adds to the reproducibility of, of these uh, studies. That way you have everything uh, confined to, to one script. And so you have your, your data input and everything else there and even your, uh, and your gra graphs and stats. <coughs> so this gets uh, a little into the weeds, and, but uh, for people that are used to, to Ecopath with Ecosim and want to see how our path works. So you still have your data and you got to take your data and get it into the system. And there's, there's two pathways. You can read in uh, a series of CSV files that are similar to what you'd put into Ecopath Ecosim, and you end up with an object, a parameter object. Or you can uh, create an R path params directly in R and then uh, populate it within R. Uh, I, I actually prefer that method because then you're not relying on any kind of external uh, files. Uh, and then once you have your R path parameter file all set up, uh, if you had stanzas, you could run you could run the stanza stuff to calculate the the, 
the trailing stand is biomass and, and consumption. Uh, and then you just run a simple R path function, and then that would give you your, your model. And then from there, you can you know, plot the web or, or, or write out the, the balanced model results if you wanted. Um, similar, if you're going to use R sim uh, part of it, you would just take that R path object that was created in the last uh, figure, and you would feed it into uh, this function R sim scenario, which runs a bunch of other sub functions that are basically just setting up all of the parameters that you would need to run the simulation. Uh, and it's just taking everything from, from your static snapshot and turning it into rates. So that way you can move forward in time. Uh, and then you end up with uh, your R sim scenario uh, object. And there you can adjust the fishing or adjust the scenario or adjust any of the forcing functions uh, within, to that scenario and then run it and end up with your rsim object. And then there's also a built-in plotting routine there that will give you an output that's similar to the EWE Windows version. And so to do, the majority of this is, is built uh, in, in R, so you can easily manipulate any of this stuff. So the, but the rsim run part of it is actually done in C++ code. Uh, and that's incorporated through the RCPP package, uh, and that allows you to actually use any of the functions within that rsim run function separately if you wanted to. Uh, but this is just basically to save time because it's a lower level language than R, and so it runs much faster for some of the numerical integration that you have to do. Um, there's two options for the numerical integration. Uh, you can do the Adams bash forth, which is um, basically two steps per month uh, moving forward, or the fourth order run, rungi kata, uh, which is a sub-monthly time step. And the difference between those really is between uh, uh, speed and, and precision. Um, there, the difference is pretty negligible, except if you start running uh, large uh, loops of simulations, then the Adams bash forth is going to be quicker. But uh, all of it runs rel relatively fast, so uh, either one is, is fine to use. Matter of fact, so this, just for a history lesson if you care, this is how the original Ecopath was, was was coded up, and then the, the newer versions run with the fourth order run Gikata. Because computational power has just gotten to the point where the sub-monthly time steps aren't, aren't as, uh, as computationally intensive as they used to be. Uh, but that's all done sort of under the hood in, R, in C++. Uh, but like I said, the code is still available, so you could modify it if you want. <clears throat> and this is just some of the examples. These are built-in graphical routines. So, uh, the web plot will get you a, a, a web plot similar to what you'd see in Ecopath of Ecosim. Uh, <clears throat> you can't drag them around like you can uh, in, in Ecopath of Ecosim. So that's a disadvantage. So you have to do a little tinkering to get them, get a good layout. But, uh, and then the rsim plot, like I said, that's almost exactly the type of plot you would see in Ecopath of Ecosim. <clears throat> So, uh, and this is just to note that RPath is not the first alternative version of, of the mass balance algorithms. So uh, there's a, a Fortran version of EWE that's available and a MATLAB version of just Ecopath, I think. I don't think they do Ecosim in that one. Uh, so if you're, if you're interested in using a different language even than R, uh, they're out there and, and available. Um, as I mentioned, R analyses are typically self-contained within one script, so uh, that makes it easier for reproducibility. Uh, and models can easily be archived on services like GitHub. Uh, and as a matter of fact, all of the code is readily available on GitHub uh, right there. And as I mentioned, some of it's written in C++, but the vast majority of it's in R, uh, which is easy for people to change. Um, I wrote this first bullet a while ago that RPath is not meant for the novice EWE user, but actually last week I met someone who told me the only reason she built her EWE model was because it was in R. So I guess take that with a grain of salt now. <laughs> I think it is easier to balance your model in the, in the Windows version, but uh, it is possible to do it in, in R. Uh, as I mentioned, all the code's transparent and it's laid out pretty nicely. So if you did want to dig into the EWE code itself, besides it being written in .NET, it's it's sort of mired in all of this gooey overhead and tangled in there and really hard to, to pull out the pieces you really want to get at. Whereas this, it's all, it's laid out pretty, 
uh, pretty logically. Uh, and, and so I hope that this will help bridge uh, the gap from some of the ecosystem management theory to practice. Uh, and one of the ways I'm going to do that is by now taking this model and making it much more useful for what's called a management strategy evaluation. Uh, so I don't know how familiar everyone is with what a management strategy evaluation is, um, but it's really a process that can help you uh, address the various forms of uncertainty that prop up during a, a management decision. And at the core, it's a closed loop simulation to help address trade-offs. And there's really two big components. So you have your uh, operating model here, which is going to be sort of your realization of the truth. Uh, so you have your fisheries research source and your, your fishery being you know, simulated. And from there, you're going to make observations into some kind of a management procedure by running it through some kind of an assessment and then comparing your outcomes to some kind of a harvest policy, whatever that is. And then whatever the, the harvest policy tells you you should do to your fishery is going to feed back into the operating model and you end up with a closed loop simulation. And so these are used uh, pretty extensively throughout a, a, a good portion of the world for how they manage fisheries, but they tend to be done on a single species, um, on single species issues and not on sort of whole ecosystem issues. Um, but if you felt like reading into all of the, the various legislation around the world, you'd find that many of the high-level policies are a call for ecosystem objectives, but we're not really addressing them uh, in, a, in, a, in an explicit manner. And, and we all know from working on fisheries that there are definitely technical and biological interactions that exist, so nothing lives in isolation. So if you are setting a quota for one species, it, it very much depends on what the quota for another species is, uh, whether you'd be able to realize that quota or not. Uh, and so that's why these, these trade-offs uh, now, are not explicitly accounted for in a single species management uh, context. And so there have been a, you know, a couple of different approaches to rectify that. Uh, people have built sort of these mice models to take into account a few uh, interactions or tried to patch together outputs from various different models. Uh, but when you do that, you tend to miss some of the dynamics of the system and you can potentially miss uh, some pretty big indirect effects that you wouldn't have accounted for if you're just modeling one portion of the system. And so the best way to really get at these ecosystem objectives is to develop a full ecosystem model uh, to, to answer these things. Um, and you may have recalled from the slide I showed not that long ago that one of the things that ecopath models or mass balance models have been uh, identified as being good at are exploring these management policy options. Um, so one more of these slides. But if we uh, now re remember the RSIM slide I showed you earlier, that was basically going from the RSIM scenario to give you a scenario object to RSIM run to give you this RSIM object. So that's how you would do it once. Um, I, I developed a function called this RSIM step that now allows you to turn it into a closed loop simulation. So you're still going to run sort of your initial uh, scenario. Uh, and then from there, you're going to generate some, some kind of data with some kind of error. So, that, you know, and you can simulate whatever kind of you know, observation error you want there. And then you take that observation, you can feed it through any kind of, you know, assessment model you want to get some reference points, compare it to a harvest control rule that would tell you some kind of a new effort that you'd want to implement. And then you could adjust the fishing into the scenario and now run it around uh, in this loop and really creating uh, a, a closed loop simulation, uh, which you can't do right now uh, otherwise. Uh, and so to demonstrate this, I, uh, I use an existing model of the George's Bank uh, system uh, that Jason Link and others developed in 2006. Uh, had an initial simulation over a range of fishing mortalities to establish what the maximum sustainable yield parameters would be just for comparisons, uh, and then tested three really simple management procedures. And so uh, this is the Georgia Bank EMAX model that stood for energy uh, ecosystem modeling and analysis exercise. Uh, and as you can see, it's actually a pretty highly aggregated model, so you have things like you know, demersal omnivores and small pelagics commercial. So, uh, and there's only one fishery, which isn't shown on this graph, uh, which uh, can make it difficult to do things. 
But I did identify sort of a, a, a target species being these demersal omnivores and a choke species in these uh, medium pelagics, um, which for the course, of, you know, for the purpose of the study, doesn't really matter what exactly they are, but just uh, so you can see that. Uh, and then I ran three management strategies, once again, very simplified, just to demonstrate how the tool works. Um, the first being sort of if it was a single species strategy where all you're really concerned about is what the biomass of the target species doing. So you would just set, set your effort uh, based on, on where you fell on, on that, you know, with a threshold of a target or a threshold of 0.5. Uh, the second strategy uh, is sort of a bycatch limited situation where you would evaluate uh, the biomass for both the target and the choke species. And then whichever one told you to fish at a lower effort would be the one you would do. Uh, so that's where if here, if it told you to fish, fish A harder than B, you would, do, you, would, you would go to B. And then the last sort of strategy is um, a bycatch constrained one where you're only looking at the biomass. Uh, well, you're looking at the biomass of the target species to set your, F, or to set your effort, but then you're also uh, giving yourself a penalty if the low choke species falls below certain biomass ranges. And so these were simulated 100 times uh, per strategy, 100 years per simulation, uh, pausing every year to generate that data and, and go through, uh, and then uh, simulating an assessment every five years uh, using a discrete Schaefer surplus production model. And so um, the observations were compared to the biological reference points, and then target Fs were determined by the harvest control rule. Uh, the target Fs are then converted to effort uh, using your basic catch equation, sort of rewritten here, uh, knowing that um, the, the catchability is set, the way that Ecopathic Ecosystem works, it's based on relative effort. So the initial snapshot that you have, that effort equals one. And so you can sort of back out a catchability from that, from that effort equals one. So it's all based on relative effort. Uh, and then I just, uh, had to, to make up some performance metrics, so an average annual biomass, and compare that to the biomass of maximum sustainable yield for both the, the target and the choke species, an average annual catch compo uh, compared to known maximum sustainable yield, and then this inner annual variation of the catch just to see how, how much it was varying from year to year, because stability is something that fishermen would care about as well. And so if you take a look at just one, one uh, simulation here, uh, you can see that the first simulation, the first scenario actually does fairly well where uh, the majority of the time you're actually fishing at a higher uh, effort than, than the model was parameterized at with only really dropping below one once. Um, you see the second is, is a little bit more variable where you have some higher effort and some lower effort, but there were three periods where you actually end up having no effort, so they shut down the fishery. Uh, and then the, the third sort of did the worst where you had periods of really high fishing and then periods where it was shut down and, and, and sort of cycled back and forth like that. Um, but when you do it 100 times, uh, you start seeing that um, the biomass does fairly well um, for the target species. Uh, the catch, uh, probably the thing you'd be most interested in if you were a, fish, if you were a fisheries manager would be that your catch for the, the target species is pretty close to the maximum sustainable yield uh, in all three scenarios. Uh, probably the thing that would give you the most pause for concern, of course, would be this biomass, where you see without, without the protections for the choke species, the, obviously the biomass does worse in that first scenario, which would probably tend you to, to lean towards the second or third strategy. Uh, but just looking at this, there's really not that much difference between those scenarios. But then if you took a look at this interannual variation of the catch, you would see that uh, what you saw from that first figure, there's much wider variation year to year using that third strategy. And actually, over the course of 100 simulations, the second one actually has even less variation than that first one does. So, uh, so that seems to indicate that that second strategy would be the best one to, to, to use. Um, so that example there and, and work that has been shown in other systems uh, shows that multi-species management can actually sometimes outperform single-species management. 
uh, which ma it makes it even more surprising that we're still having this uh, slow progress towards EBFM. Uh, but hopefully, you know, having a tool like this will really help um, in, a in the aid of testing some of these uh, ecosystem strategies so people can see the difference uh, and how they're working. Uh, and as I mentioned, this was a, a simple example to really showcase the methodology rather than the model. Uh, so you could make a much more complicated model and have a lot more moving pieces. Uh, but I think it still highlights the effect of the technical interactions. And just so everyone knows, that each batch of these 100 simulations took under two minutes. So you really ha have the, the capability of running a wide range of, uh, of um, uh, sensitivity analysis for any bits and pieces of the system that you want. Because you know, if, if you try to do something like this in Atlantis, you're talking you know, a couple days or something. Uh, so you can do this in, you know, in an afternoon if you set it up right. <clears throat> and so now, you know, moving, knowing that the tool exists, uh, I, I needed to, to try and, and implement it in, in actual management. And so to do that, I uh, took a look at uh, George's Bank. And so for those of you not familiar with George's Bank is, uh, so this is Cape Cod right here. So this is Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, so Woods Hole, where I work, is, is right here. Uh, so George's Bank is a submarine plateau that's uh, just off the coast there. Uh, it's really highly productive because it's shallow and uh, it's supported commercial fisheries since the 16th century. Uh, and because of sort of the uniqueness, of, you know, geographically and oceanographically and all those other things, it's considered a, a really good place for place-based management. And because of all that I just said, uh, we've been studying it for a really long time. You know, we have a, a fisheries independent survey that goes back to the 60s that's been sampling George's Bank. Uh, and people have been building models too. So when we start thinking about a management strategy evaluation for George's Bank, it's almost like the, the Goldilocks, right? Like, so let's try and find the model that'll, that'll, that'll do the, the most good here. And so there's, there's a bunch of different models, that are ecosystem models that already exist for George's Bank. Uh, we have this Hydra, which is a length-based multi-species model, uh, but that is 10 species, so it's more of one of those mice models. Uh, we have an Atlantis model, which of course has the spatial temporal dynamics that we don't see in, in some of the other models, but it has high computational overhead, uh, and it's hard to really run a lot, a lot of these scenarios. And then, of course, we have EWE, but uh, the model I just showed you is the existing one for Georgia Bank, so it's highly aggregated and only has one fleet, so that's really not going to help us out for this either. Um, so I've been updating the mass balance model, and so now I, I've broken out all of the commercial and important species, so that way they're represented, uh, divided the fleet into major gear categories. And I've been doing that using uh, a fairly com contemporary time period from 2013 to 2015, and did this, of course, in, in our path. Um, when you balance these models, you, you look at uh, what's called ecotrophic efficiency, which is the uh, amount of mortality that's explained in the model. And so anything that was greater than one is not possible. Uh, you, you can't have more mortality than you can explain. Uh, and then when I was balancing it, I also took into account uh, a series of pre-balanced diagnostics that Jason Link came up with. Uh, and, and a lot of these are sort of rely on first order principles from ecology. So uh, you take a look at biomass across trophic levels some biomass ratios, vital rates and, and total production and, and, and removals. And so we end up with a, a model that looks like this, uh, a little bit more complicated than the other one. Uh, the new Georgia Bank model has 69 groups, 57 of them are, are species groups with the 10 fleets that aren't on this picture. Uh, and then two detrital groups uh, as well. And if you take a look at uh, a slope of sort of uh, biomass over um, log biomass over trophic level, uh, you see a general pattern that, that you'd expect. There's a few outliers here that don't really fall along the line. And these are things that aren't on the bank all that often. So southern demersals are, are coming up on the bank. And redfish are more of a Gulf of Maine species to the north. Uh, and that slopes a little bit steeper than what was recommended by Jason Link. And uh, I sort of account that to the fact that this is a highly productive system that is seriously overexploited. So a lot of these things on the right side of that graph are driven down and, and you have higher levels on the left. So you obviously end up with a steeper curve. Um, 
And to sort of try and get away from these outliers, I took, I just started summing the biomasses by uh, quarter trophic levels. Uh, and that's what this bottom plot is. Uh, and the, the slope's a little bit closer to the prescribed five to 10% slope, but it's still a little steeper. Also took a look at some of these ratios. Uh, and I don't expect you guys to look all the way through this, but just to see, you wanna see most of these ratios uh, below one. Uh, but some of them are above one, and that really speaks to the fact that on George's Bank, there's a lot of omnivory that's happening, so there's not one directed predator on a prey. So seeing, uh, seeing a ratio of a lot more of a predator than their prey isn't necessarily wrong in this situation because that predator is looking at a much wider swath of, of a prey field. Uh, and so uh, just a couple take homes from looking at just the snapshot of this new George's Bank model is that a majority of the production occurred within the lower trophic levels, um, with the largest portion of the biomass in the benthic invertebrates, uh, so something like your scallops here, which is a big fishery. Uh, over half the biomass of the fish species are in the benthivores, and you might even be able to make it out, but that's, uh, that's a goose fish right there. Not really a benthivore, but. Uh, and then planktivores have the highest consumption of the fish species, which was, once again, from sort of ecological theory, you would expect. Um, but this is where I sort of have a, a novel thing for fitting the data. So um, the balanced snapshot is just one possible permutation of the parameters that you could use for a model. Uh, but to address the uncertainty, I wanted to draw multiple parameter sets and run those forward. And so I used a simplified Bayesian synthesis approach that Karim Aiden developed called EcoSense. Uh, to take into account some general thermodynamic principles and informative priors uh, on these input parameters. And so the way you can think of this work works is so you have your initial snapshot here, and then Ecopath of Ecosim has this thing called a pedigree, so you can tell it how much uh, confidence you have in the, in the, in the, in the data. And that's going to generate a series of, of parameter sets. Um, and then you can run those forward 50 years, and if anything dies at all, then they're not possible, right? So you throw those ones out, and now you have a much smaller subset of, of model, possible models that you can run forward into any kind of permutation that you want, uh, perturbation rather. Uh, and then around that, you can sort of get an error bounds around where you think uh, your outcome would be. Uh, and so, uh, so you, one of those things you have to do is then, you know, establish your pedigree, and you rank them, you know, one to eight, uh, so you can see sort of what the uh, the range of, of that you're going to allow the um, the resampling to be, and from that I generated 30,000 possible parameter sets, and from that uh, a little over a thousand had all the species per, uh, persisting, so about three uh, percent, which is about what to be expected. And so one of the things that this is doing that the Monte Carlo routine, the ecopathic ecosystem, doesn't do is it also is resampling vulnerabilities. Uh, so that can make some really crazy wild. Um, uh, parameter sets, and those not familiar with EWE vulnerabilities, is sort of the top-down versus bottom-up of the system. Uh, and, but I wanted to take that a step further and say, all right, these are a, a set of plausible uh, parameter sets, but I wanted to refine it based on the model performance. So I looked ahead at two different sort of applications, a single-species one and a multi-species one. And so I, ha I, I parameterized the snapshot from 2013 to 2015, so I had some data past that, you know, 2016 to 2018. And I wanted to just take a look and say, all right, if I want to get the landings in the biomass for, say, Atlantic herring to where it is now, what would the effort level have to be to get there? And so then I drove the model through that, and uh, so I adjusted the effort uh, to achieve these new biomass landings, um, and then simulated that forward for 50 years, and saw where that biomass and landings fell within two-fold of what the actual uh, observed biomass and landings were, uh, and then consider those sort of valid parameter sets to work with. Um, in the case of the multi-species example, I had to use aggregate biomass uh, and landings because uh, otherwise I ended up with three parameter sets, which uh, really wasn't enough. <coughs> and part of that was probably the, the granularity still of the fleets, even though there's 10 fleets, uh, because in the example I had uh, haddock, is increasing and cod and yellowtail are decreasing, so they were sort of 
opposed to each other where one was calling for an increase in effort, the other was calling for a decrease in effort. So lessons learned. And so this is sort of the results you get. So this is just taking a look at the biomass value. So the top is all 1,000 sets of parameters. And then the bottom is the set of parameters run through that were within twofold. Um, and then you can see, uh, taking a look, uh, so the, the blue dashed line is the actual realized uh, or the observed data. Uh, and so that falls within the interquartile range of all those, uh, all those parameter sets run forward for the herring. See something similar, of course, with uh, the multi-species example here. Uh, one thing I did find interesting, and I should have put them on the same slide, is so notice here at the lower trophic levels, uh, there was a lot of parameter sets that called for some really low biomass values of uh, the lower, the, like phytoplankton and zooplankton and stuff of that nature for the herring. But for this set of parameter sets, we're not seeing that. And I count that to the fact that uh, the herring are just one level above that and are feeding on that. So they could probably handle that, whereas these other species are, are up the, the food chain. And so they needed to make sure that there was a bigger base there to get it all the way up to cod, haddock, and yellowtail. Um, and so then similar plot, once again, the blue line being uh, the realized version. You can see mostly for the landings. So it underestimates the landings for hot haddock because that's the species that's doing really well. And then sort of overestimates the yellowtail and the cod landings uh, because of that sort of give and take between the two. But then when you look in aggregate, it, it hit it pretty well. Uh, same thing for the reverse in the biomass. Um, so <clears throat> just a final synthesis to wrap up. I know the sort of whirlwind stuff I've been talking about. Um, Ecosystem-based fisheries management is inherently place-based, and so a place like George's Bank is really ideally suited for doing that place-based management. Uh, but doing so will really require us to improve our ecosystem models that we have, so that way we can gain a better understanding of the system and really address these trade-offs well. Uh, and one such model that does this well is mass balance. Um, that mass balance is popularized by Ecopath Ecosim, uh, but it can be difficult for non-programmers to modify uh, and can suffer from a lack of reproducibility. So I think this R path really alleviates some of this problem because it's written in a language that's easily, un not easily, but is understood more by ecologists. And the common practices within R readily support reproducibility. And I should add in their community um, development as well. And so that really creates a, a flexible tool uh, and so I showed how I took our, our path and was able to modify it to allow for a, a completely closed loop simulation. And uh, that same feature I think can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, I think you can use it to link to other models, whether that's of other model types such as economic models um, or linking to other mass balance models. So you could almost think of it as a really coarse eco space where you could have a model of George's Bank and a model of Gulf of Maine and you could track the biomass flow between the two or even like uh, a model of the Mid-Atlantic and a model of the Chesapeake Bay and have bi biomass flow between the, the, the bays and the open ocean. Um, and then I also showed you how you can apply uh, you know, parameter uncertainties such as EcoSense uh, to, to get at some of that. Um, and I think it's important too to realize and you know the meetings we had this past couple weeks is that really management deadlines are often on timelines that are much more accelerated than, than model development horizons. And so having models that are flexible and adaptable is really useful. Uh, and so having this New Georgia Bank model uh, that has better resolution of species and fleets is, will be helpful moving forward with whatever type of management question that the councils bring to us uh, and that it and I think I demonstrated, although there's a little bit more work to do, that it can then be tuned for specific management questions and really get the best parameter set to, to address whatever their needs are, uh, which I think will make it so it's ready, ready to be used in any kind of uh, management strategy evaluation as an operating model. Uh, and so, you know, the, the goal of ecosystem-based fisheries management is to maintain resilient uh, ecosystems. And one way to do that is through building these better tools that are useful for management. And I think our path represents uh, improvement to the ecosystem 
modeling toolbox. And through the community development and other open source uh, practices, I think the possibilities are really endless with what we can do with this stuff. So uh, with that, I will take, uh, I'd like to acknowledge people from my dissertation committee, uh, and then especially um, Karim, who wasn't on my committee, but he did a lot of the initial coding for the C++. Um, and Andre who Punt, who saw the usefulness of this for MSE, because that wasn't originally what the tool was designed for. Uh, and then a bunch of colleagues at the Northeast Fishery Science Center as well. Uh, and with that, I will take any questions. <laughs>